Once upon a time, on the planet Kerbin, there were three brothers. Bill Kerman, the engineer, Jebediah Kerman, the pilot, and Bob Kerman, the scientist. These three were different in their temperaments and their abilities, but they were alike in that they shared a love for all things that fly. In their youth, they started an aircraft company. They researched, designed, built, and flew high-performance, high-power, high-altitude aircraft. They were the first to explore the high Mach numbers. They were the first to fly an aircraft completely out of Kerbin's atmosphere and into the vacuum of space. They were the first to return to a safe landing. Seeing the tremendous potential of exploring outer space, they hatched a crazy plan. 60 years ago, their own Kerbal Space Agency set the goal of taking one of their vehicles out of Kerbin orbit and all the way to the surface of the moon to land there to take scientific measurements and samples to return to planet Kerbin for a safe landing. Many attempts were made. Many vehicles failed. Many Kerbals died. You know, they were always cloned again. It's always just a temporary setback. And eventually, they were successful. They landed on the moon. They learned many things, and they took that knowledge back to planet Kerbin. In the years immediately following the Great Moon Adventure, the Kerbal Space Agency turned to more conventional aircraft production, using the technologies developed for that great adventure to make better aircraft. Thirty years ago, while testing a new experimental aircraft, the three brothers were surprised to encounter a black monolith floating above the lawn of the Kerbal Space Center. They landed nearby, they approached to learn more about it, and the monolith, in some inexplicable fashion, communicated with them. It placed information and ideas directly into their heads. It communicated a message. Jebediah immediately took off again in order to pass on this important message to all of Kerbal Kind. But in his excitement, he lost control of the aircraft. He crashed, and all three brothers were killed. Again. No, the don't worry, they could be cloned again. But unfortunately, the contents of that message that the monolith communicated to them was lost. Simultaneously with the discovery of the black monolith, Kerbal scientists detected muon emissions that started emanating from the surface of the moon. A plan was made to send Kerbals back to the moon in order to investigate the source of these muon emissions, because it seemed certain that they had to be related to the black monolith. One brave Kerbinaut named Miguel Kerbio, the very first Kerbal to actually set foot on the surface of the moon. He landed there, he went to investigate. Uh, unfortunately, he should have been a little more careful because he tripped over his own feet, fell down a hill, and died. It was very sad. A replacement Kerbinaut was sent to the moon, Orville Kerman. He was there for a couple of days, and then simultaneously, all contact was lost with Orville, and the muon emissions ceased. Neither were ever heard from again. Following this tragedy, the Kerbal government interceded and forbade anybody from returning to the surface of the moon. They believed that the entire incident with the black monolith must have been a hoax, and that it would be a foolish waste of resources and Kerbal lives to continue throwing people at this investigation for something that probably doesn't even exist. The Kerbal Space Agency survived. They returned again to aircraft development. Two years ago, the Kerbal Space Agency convinced investors and government officials that there was profit to be made by returning to space. They began simple communication satellites. They developed new launching technology. They established uh, Kerbal's first space station to study and learn more about the possibilities of lo a long-term presence in space. Things were looking good for the space agency until, and of what should have been a routine flight of the Spork 10 experimental prototype space plane launcher, serious design flaws were discovered that resulted in a loss of control during re-entry and a crash into the ocean that killed Jebediah Kerman. Possibly for good this time, since cloning had in the meantime been outlawed. This tragedy was followed very shortly by the discovery of more design flaws in the construction of Space Station Adventure, design flaws that led to the decision to deorbit and destroy the space station. After these two very expensive mistakes, Bill and Bob Kerman together agreed that the space agency needed to slow down. 
they ceased launching things and they did a very thorough review of their entire industry. Two weeks ago, Kerbals returned to space, a new rocket, a new satellite, a scan sat, went into polar orbit around Kerbin in order to find out more about the planet on which they're living and also to test the scan sat system before sending it to other bodies in the Kerbal system. One week ago, Bill Kerman met with his brother, Bob, and Bill told him that he was leaving the space agency to join the monks at the desert temple. Bill told Bob that he was concerned about the mysteries that he expected that scan sat to find. He said he was leaving in order to find answers elsewhere. Bob was very puzzled, but wished him well. And that brings us up to the present day. This morning, Bob Kerman showed up to work to find a somewhat troubling report waiting for him. Good morning, Mr. Director. Hey, Archie, good morning to you. How are you doing? Hey, you're in early, aren't you? Yes, sir, I am. I didn't want to stay away. I had to get back to analyzing those anomalies, you know. Anomalies? Uh, anomalies what? Well, from the ScanSat. ScanSat anomalies? Mr. Director, has nobody told you yet? No, no, I don't think they have. Oh, oh dear. Sir, the ScanSat data analysis team, it happened uh, yesterday afternoon. I realize it's your day off, but maybe they really should have called you. I can't imagine why they wouldn't. Hey, have. stop. Okay, yeah, they didn't call me. That's good. Tell me, what anomalies? Sir, the ScanSat and data analysis team has found at several sites scattered over the face of Kerbin, we're getting signals that they quite simply do not understand. It appears to be, say, exotic metals at a couple of them. Another one is actually emitting muons. You know, when's the last time anybody detected muons? Damn you, Bill. I'm sorry, sir, it was something about Bill? Never mind. Go on. Well, that's, uh, that's really what I have. We don't know what any of these are, and we've ruled out instrumentation error. It's very exciting. We're just getting into the analysis now. The largest one appears to be over on the western continent in this unpopulated area. It looks very much like large Kerbal-made structures sitting inside of a deep crater in the middle of the plains. Inside a crater. Structures. Yes, Mr. Director. I don't understand it yet but I'm certain it's very exciting. We're trying to figure out what it is. That largest site, McSaucerson has already taken a research plane. He's headed there now. Hopefully in a few hours, we'll get an eyes on report of what exactly is there. Oh my God. Um, Archie, listen, how many people know about this? Can we keep it quiet? Oh, keep it quiet. I'm very sorry, Mr. Director, but the world already knows about it. We've been blogging, we've had a camera set up with a live feed inside the analysis room. I gather a couple members of the team have already fielded questions from the early morning news shows. Damn you, Bill. Yeah, took a while, but I'm here. We're in, in the middle of this plain. It's very far from any populated areas. There appears to be some kind of crater. Um, it's far enough away, even remote, I can see how this thing could go unknown and unremarked for quite some time. Uh, very unusual crater right in the middle of the plain, no hills or anything surrounding it. It is obviously, this is not an impact crater, no meteorite. This is not volcanic in appearance. Uh, several kilometers away, and I have to say it appears to be a sinkhole of some sort. Uh, I'm not close enough yet to look down into it. Hang on. Okay, approaching very close to overhead now. Let's see what we can see. Hello! KSC, I can confirm there are clear evidence of Kerbal-made structures at the bottom of this this depression. I, it uh, certainly appears to be a sinkhole, but how could structures be at the bottom of it? Uh, it's obvious it is no natural formation. I'll circle around for another look. Honestly, the first quick glimpse, I it appeared to be... I. A launch tower in a vehicle assembly building. I know that can't possibly be it. And I'm losing daylight. 
And fortunately, this vehicle, yeah, is, uh, this cannot handle it uh, off-field landing. So maybe that one quick glimpse is all we're going to get, KSC. We'll probably have to come back tomorrow, or better yet, to do a land expedition. You're definitely going to need some mountaineering equipment to get in there and investigate. Meanwhile, on the other side of Kerbin, a young Kerbal unaffiliated with the space agency, an avid mountain climber, had been watching the news and had seen notice of a muon emitting anomaly of some sort located on a mountaintop near to where he lived. It was a short trip for him. He climbed up there to take a look at it. Being a true Kerbal, an excellent representative of his race, Zarius was blessed with very large amounts of courage and curiosity and somewhat of a deficit of caution. Therefore, he walked straight into it just to see what it would do. Kerbals. You, Kerbals. Your spacecraft awaken. You awaken. The Kraken awakens. You awaken the Kraken. The Kraken returns. The Kraken returns. You prepare. You must tell Kerbals. Prepare. The Kraken returns. Welcome to the prelude for Let's Fly Kerbal Space Program Chapter 3, Legend of the Kraken. Both the start of something new and the continuation of a plotline I started, uh, like, what is it, like two and a half years ago? Something like that? Yeah, yeah, this will be uh, ret retcon and tying up loose ends and proceeding into new territory. It's going to be a good time. Hi, I am the Winter Owl, occasionally known as White Owl, occasionally known as Matt. Call me any one of those, whichever one you like. Why is this thing toolbar plugin update available? Right click to dismiss. Thank you. <laughs> Getting distracted by stuff. Okay, okay, so we're going to be um, entering into a new chapter. Uh, we have many things similar to the series that preceded the KSP Rescaled. Uh, I'm using FAR with the default settings. I'm using Deadly Reentry with the, um, actually an older version of Deadly Reentry that um, that does not have the irritating parachute warnings, like again, using default settings. Uh, TAC life support, so that all, all my Kerbals I have to keep track of of their food, their water, and their air. Um, and in addition, I am not using the mods, but I am uh, doing house rules, very similar to a couple of, of these mods. Uh, I've got a communication satellite network because I'm going to be a sort of a lightweight version of remote tech. I don't feel the need to install the mod, but I but my I am just going to for role play purposes and to make it more interesting for me where my Kerbals have to have uh, communication satellites. Um, also another another thing I did not install the mod the construction time, but uh, you can see over here on my alarm, the next thing that's going to happen, vehicle assembly building number two will be constructed. I have house ruled up a system for uh, there being, uh, you know, rockets take time to assemble. And I have multiple vehicle assembly buildings. The The first one that we have can do small rockets. The second one will do medium-sized rockets. The VAB number three, which is, yeah, it's still got a couple hundred days to go before VAB number three is ready. That one will be able to construct our big monsters. Um, frankly, I'm not so interested at this point of in in uh, sharing my my actual formula that I'm that I'm working on uh, for for how long it takes to build these things, and also the the reusable vehicles will have uh, you know maintenance time after they do a flight. They'll have to spend so many times so many so many. Uh, so much time in the hangar, uh, you know, resetting everything, inspecting and repairs. I'm not going to share the details of that. First off, because it's a uh, continuous work in progress, I'm still adjusting and tweaking and fine-tuning things. And second of all, because my overall goal is to tell a story, I may find it necessary to kind of fudge the timing on these things. We both, you know, for, for drama. Uh, either make things take take longer or, or be available faster than the actual official rule set. And I don't want people calling me out on that. 
<laughs> okay, the the system that I'm using, I this is different from what was in KSB Rescaled, and I'm still using the, the real solar system mod, but I have uh, spliced together, I've copy-pasted pieces of several different RSS configurations for the stock Kerbal system. Uh, just our local Kerbin system is a good example. Kerbin is 6.4 times the size of stock. This is what I was accustomed to previously. And so it takes right, you know, between 7,200, 7,500 meters per second at delta V to reach orbit. The atmosphere extends up to just under 92 kilometers. What I'm doing differently now is we're doing different scales for different bodies. The moon is 3.2 times the size of stock. So it's actually relative to Kerbin, smaller than, than in stock. Minmus. I realize, what's the whole point of Minmus? Minmus is supposed to be small. Minmus is stock scale. Minmus is not scaled up. So we've got 6.4 scale, 3.2 stock, and the distances between all these bodies are 10 times stock. So if you want to travel, say, to the moon, it takes about a day and a half to get there. A round trip is three days. And I've applied this, this design philosophy uh, to all the bodies in the system. The sun is 10 times stock. Jewel is 10 times stock. All the distances between everything is 10 times. Most of the planets and moons are 3.2 times stock, mostly because this um, allows it to be larger than in stock, but gives you int uh, interestingly varied terrain. Uh, you still have, you know, uh, interesting to look at and interesting to land on hills and valleys. Uh, the exception being uh, Eve, because the whole point of Eve is it's supposed to be much larger and more difficult than Kerbin. Eve is 6.4 times stock. The same story with Lathe, the uh, moon of Jewel, is also 6.4 because Lathe is supposed to be like a second Kerbin. Uh, and other bodies, say for example the uh, Gilly down here, Gilly. What would be the point of scaling Gilly up and making Gilly larger than stock? That would be foolish. No, Gilly is supposed to be small, so Gilly is small. A couple of um, uh, Jewel's moons are also are also stock. They have not been scaled up at all. Uh, I'd made a few slight slight tweaks. Uh, Kerbin has a 24-hour day. It also has a 365-day year. Uh, made certain that Duna. I made certain that Ike is in a ground stationary orbit around Duna, and that Ike is tidally locked. So that is all working well. Okay, so uh, my idea that this for for the the general direction of this series, uh, I'm going to be. Most of the series is going to continue to be you know, building and flying rockets. I'm going to occasionally have some of the, the, the dramas with the, the Kerbal dialogue. Uh, you know, just every so once in a while, when these guys have plot points. They continue to f search and find things out about black monoliths and other surprises that I have scattered throughout the Kerbal, the Kerbal system. Uh, I've given these guys a good reason once they learn more about, about the plot. I'm not giving everything away just yet. Uh, I've given these guys a good reason to want to travel to Jewel, to travel to Elu, to travel everywhere in the system. Probably going to travel everywhere multiple times. Uh, we're on tech levels. Uh, even though I'm playing in sandbox, again, I'm house ruling a, a sense of, for a sense of technological progression. Uh, here, let's go ahead and I was focused on that. Let's go ahead and take a look at their space station because that's one thing that's coming up. At the moment. My Kerbals are all using simple chemical rocket engines. They're going to continue to use these until such time as I set up a more or less permanent presence on the moon and or Minmus. Now, once we get with a, a permanent, uh, yeah, permanent manned presence on, on either one of those two bodies or both, then I will allow my Kerbals to uh, discover nuclear engines and ion engines for the probes. Yeah, here we are, the, the bits and pieces of Space Station Adventure Reborn awaiting the, uh, the the core to be sent up. We can't send the core until, in, with our, where, where'd my alarm clock go? My alarm clock back. Yeah, until VAB number two gets constructed and we can build a larger rocket capable of launching the core. Okay, so yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll get 
they'll get nuclear engines, they'll get ion engines. Then after I get Kerbals to do a manned landing and return uh, from some other planet, uh, be, be it Lathe, Duna, Duna's the, the popular choice, but maybe I'll have reason to go somewhere else. Yeah, a manned landing and return from some other planet, um, then they will get to start to unlock. I should actually get into the, the vehicle assembly building and start to look at this stuff. Uh, I have these different components in here for uh, the near future propulsion pack, which I really like the looks of. Here, let's pull this thing up just so we can attach these other things to it. Magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters and grid ion thrusters, uh, Vasimer plasma thrusters. Uh, my Kerbals will not unlock all of, of the... Here we go. Yeah, we'll not unlock all of near future propulsion all at once, but we'll, st we'll begin gradually unlocking some of these different technologies then. So that'll be a good time. Uh, I know that I have a, a very, very bad track record with ending series. Uh, I'll say that I do have a plotline in mind. It includes an ending. I know how I want to end this series, but I imagine it is going to take a long time to get there. And I, still, and I already have ideas for other series that I want to do after this one. Uh, but, but this is it, yeah. Yeah. Chapter 3, Legend of the Kraken. It is going to be a good time. I am looking forward to it. And yeah, so this is the after, after the intro. Next episode, we'll be back into just regular flying rockets. Yeah, the next thing that they want to do is they're going to send scan sats to both the moon and min mist. These, these are missions that were already planned before uh, the great this <laughs> before the great complication of finding all these things, these surprises on the surface of Kerbin. So those missions are going to continue. We also need uh, some satellite networks, um, communication satellites around both of those bodies, and then after that. We'll start looking... Oh, oh, yeah, and also continue on the construction of the space station. And then we'll see what other directions the, the plot will take us. It is going to be a good time. I am very happy to be sharing this with you. I'm looking forward to doing some more. I'll talk to you then. Goodbye. <laughs>